meeting to order first. It is 3.08 p.m. And then the next thing on the list is the approval of the minutes from October 29th. All right, I have been, I have been up. Um, so okay. yeah, we're calling the meeting to order at 3.08 p.m. Uh, all members are present. We have a vacancy uh, currently, which is one of the items on the agenda um, with the um, recent appointment of Steve Olson as the interim treasurer. We have a vacancy on the um, uh, public uh, member, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, um, but all other members are present. Um, Yes, so we'll move to um, approval of the agenda. And so is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Thank you. Any second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Uh, um, all right, so uh, anybody opposed to approving the agenda? Let's go that way. <laughs> okay, so hearing no opposition, agenda is approved. Um, We'll open for public comment. I'm looking at the uh, attendees. There are no, uh, there's no other attendees at this time and no one raising their hands to speak. So um, moving forward, we have the uh, approval of minutes for the October 29th meeting. And just as a reminder where um, we are um, trying to make sure we, uh, Take, we take minutes, we adopt the minutes, we take them to city council so that there's a public record of everything that, um, that the budget committee's uh, reviewing and, and making recommendations on. And so uh, we have the October 29th, 2021 uh, minutes. Is there any questions? And if not, is there a motion to approve? Yes, motion to approve. Thank you. Thank any you. Second? A second, James. All right, thank you. And then anybody opposed? No. So we'll consider the minutes approved and those will go forward to the city council. So, uh, so that leads us to, we have four items on the agenda today and uh, I, we have a simple PowerPoint to kind of go through those items. I have the PowerPoint up, but I didn't have my agenda um, handy. So apologies for the delay there, but um, uh, we have just a few items. So the first item on the agenda today is actually talking about what we mentioned a few moments ago with the Finance and Budget Committee member vacancy. Um, we pulled uh, the documents uh, from the past to kind of uh, see like how this was formally created. It's actually, um, we did not find it in the city code. I had thought it was in there for a couple of years, but I, I didn't, we didn't find it. And so we pulled the past uh, council action. And what we found is that the fiscal policy budget committee and audit committee, they were two separate committees initially, were created on April 11th, 2000 by the city council at that time. Uh, although it was two separate committees, they both had the same members for the first 13 years. Um, the members were two city council members and the city treasurer. And then as staff, it was the city manager and the finance director. And so, which is essentially what we have here today. Um, but what we also found is that they were then combined together as one committee. And on May 14th, 2013, the, uh, when, when they were combined, the city also added a public member position. The city council approved adding a public member position. And so um, in the past, uh, we had Alan Raines serving with us as the treasurer and then Steve Olson um, was kind enough to serve as our public member. Now that he is serving as the interim treasurer, uh, we, the, you know, essentially Pam and I are coming to the committee to ask uh, if there's any um, preference of, of uh, what we do with that public member position or any suggestion of who should be included. Uh, we wanted to ask the committee for feedback and then um, if everybody's in agreement, then move move forward to the city council with a consent item to approve whatever that that recommendation is. So uh, at this point, the, the first item is essentially, um, we'll open it up as 
what everybody's thinking about filling this public member position. So does anybody have any, oh, Brandy, I see your hand up. Hey, hey James, you know, we had Steve and, um, um, uh, Jeff, Jeff, I was just funny. I, I have Alan still on my, on, on my tongue, but yeah. we had those as one and two and, and, uh, and Steve pretty much, you know, pretty much one, you know, everyone in, it was four to one, but really it was five to one or five to zero. Um, I, I had nominated Jeff, so I kept with Jeff, um, but with them being one and two, why don't we offer the, um, the public membership um, thing to Jeff and see if he'd like to do that. That's, that's my thought. That'd be, you know, that'd be logical and fine. Um, we, we thought about recommending that, but we also figured we'd open it up and see if anybody had any ideas. So I think I just saw, yeah, Betsy put, put um, our mayor sticks. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate that, Randy, and that makes logical sense. Um, I'd also just like to say, I think it'd be important to have somebody in here who really cares about the environment because uh, particularly right now in history, we're gonna have to make some decisions uh, to take care of our, the planet and our town. And it'd be great to have somebody who was um, involved in making financial decisions that where that was a top priority. Mm -hmm. Well, all I can say on behalf of Jeff Raines is, is uh, he's been riding a bike in this community for probably 20 years. He's probably even been more attuned to the environment. Now, maybe it's just easier for him to get around from his house to Raines <laughs> department store on a bike. But um, next to Sousa, he's probably the, the person that I've seen um, the, um, you know, most sensitive to the environment. Also, his wife is very, very much in tune with it. Okay. Um, Great. So, having said that, I'm open to anything. I'm not stuck. I'm not married to Jeff, or I'm just thinking what's easy. I don't know. Yeah. How do we go about that? Do we publish that? That that's what we're looking for. How do how do we go about filling it under those um, yeah. guidelines, Mayor? Yeah, we wanted to see if anybody had a thought off the top of there, like, or you know, if everybody had like an immediate reaction. If not, we we could um, consider putting you know like a public notice out on our website in a couple places asking if somebody's interested. So that would be another. And so when um, when I applied for the committee, I read it in the paper and saw that they needed somebody and thought, oh, that'd be something to be get involved or get back involved in but i support jeff reigns as an appointed person or if he turns us down which i have no idea but if he says no then i would say maybe we sh then we should um do a public announcement like they did when i was appointed mm -hmm. yeah i could see doing that well in in, in terms of diversity and inclusion you know because most people won't know about this at all so just to make sure everybody knows that this is happening i, I do think um public announcement would be good and not to slight anybody or it's not personal just making sure that everybody's invited in right because it is a public you know public member position as is said in our policy mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we what we did with the treasurer's position is something we could do similarly, which is we put an ad in the paper and on our website, and then we did send um, to the you know to the candidates that um, we knew that the city council had mentioned. We sent um, information to as well, so that we made sure that they were aware of it. So we could do a similar thing here where we um, uh, post an ad and then we send it, uh, you know, send the information to Jeff to see if he would want to apply for it um, as one of the candidates and then see see what happens from there. So, Yeah, I'm all for that. I, it doesn't. Yeah that, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we'll, we'll start there. I think if, um, 
if Jeff's the only applicant, uh, um, is there, do we want to, um, do we want to come back and see how it goes? Or if Jeff's the, is the, is the only applicant, would we say we're in consensus that we would, that would be the recommendation if he's the only person and then we can just go straight to council? That seems. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll proceed and we'll let everybody know kind of what, what happens with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So that's item one. Item two is um, related to our investment policy. And, and uh, I think uh, Pam and I were talking before the meeting. I think we, uh, it's just a couple, a couple of items. So I'll try to kind of get through them because I think um, uh, there's not a whole lot of um, uh, density to these. So I think we can get through these relatively quickly. But um, the investment policy, um, is on the agenda because the auditors base the auditors uh, one of their recommendations to us was that they had noted that our treasurer reports were not prepared in accordance with our investment policy, and the the way it was um, to explain what that means our investment policy right now says that within thirty days of the end of each month that we'll have a treasurer's uh, investment report on a city council agenda. And so last year, there were a couple, I think there were a couple of months that we missed that because of um, just uh, because of the um, just because of the timing of the council meetings. And so in particular, July, uh, August of every year, we usually have or the last couple of years, we've been able to, to schedule where we've had two meetings off where everybody gets a little bit of a summer recess. And so uh, that means that we don't have a meeting for 45 days or so. And so um, mostly because of that summer holiday and the winter holiday, we are realizing that we won't be able to regularly or, you know, to comply with the 30 day requirement every month, every year, basically. And so uh, after, the auditors pointed out that on those months we're not meeting this 30 day requirement. Um, the recommendation after talking that through with the auditor was basically to update the investment policy to say within 60 days. Um, we would still strive for 30 days and we maybe should include language saying that, but on the months where the, there's no council meeting that this would allow us to um, stay in compliance with the policy. And so we're recommending um, that, and I, I would say I, I'll kind of modify this a little right now as we're speaking, is we're recommending updating the policy to say within 60 days, but that we'll strive for uh, within 30 days where, where possible that um, the treasurer's report will be submitted to the city council. And so we're asking the committee uh, to support that uh, modification uh, and we're happy to answer any questions or, or anything about that change. Uh, Council Member Haney. So James, I see it references a California a code. Uh -huh. So there's a reporting co code that says that uh, uh, these reports ha are, are, you know, is it a demand? They have to be submitted every 30 days. Yeah, and I don't think that the 30 days is in the code, uh, but Pam, are you, are you aware? No. Was, well, it says shall submit the monthly investment report. Yeah. I think the 30 days is our policy. I think the code, the government code just requires that it be reported. Yeah. Um, so let's see, I'm looking at the code section. Because if the, uh, what I'm looking at is if the report is submitted to the oversight committee first, mm -hmm. May, maybe that's the uh, the guideline is that it's submitted to the oversight committee and then provided to council um, within 30 days after submission to the committee. It seems like the committee should be seeing these reports prior to the council if, if that's what the standing committee is supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's true. Pam, is this the is that box there? Is that the excerpt from our policy? Yes, it is. Okay. And I could be wrong in that. That's why I'm wondering if, if there's a if there's a state code 
we have to obviously follow it. We can't yeah. deviate from it. Yeah, and I think right now, uh, just to, um, yeah, you know, as I'm looking at, I'm looking at the government code section, it's a little gray. It says that there's a, um, a monthly report or this, um, let me see. Maybe delegated for one year period by the legislative body to the trigger. Yeah, I think we'll need to we'll need to review that section closer. I'm not sure, Pam. Did the I think I thought you had said the auditors had recommended this, so they should know. But yeah, uh, they they said 50 or 60 days, and we agreed on 60 because in case of the summer break plus. In case we delay the first meeting, then that takes us over to 50 days. Mm -hmm. So we thought 60 day would cover it. But yeah, but the government code section is written a little weird where it does talk about monthly reports, even though it doesn't say 30 days. So I think we need to review it with the auditors again. I think they're reading that as you have to submit at least, well, something. Mm -hmm. um, on a month, maybe. Yeah, what was uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Pam. What was the city that went uh, down in Orange County that um, I imagine that this was one of the reasons they put this code into place was, uh, um, what's the city that almost. Oh, uh, Bell, is that the one you're No, no, down in Orange County. Uh, oh. Remember they, uh, their investments were, took their city. I mean, they bankrupt their city. Yeah. And I was just wondering if, this was one of the reasons behind it was there were no re no reporting of uh, monthly transactions or of investment and because that's what they did is they invested poorly and got uh, uh, beat up in a, in a stock market uh, collapse. All right. Yeah, I'm reading this government code section. It looks like yeah, I think uh, reading it, it's saying that we have to provide a monthly report, but it doesn't say it it doesn't say that it has to be provided within a certain number of days. Uh, and so I think putting the two together and I'm, you know, I think uh, I would say let's, uh, we'll take a deeper dive in this and come back, but putting the two together, I think what the government code requirement requires us to do a monthly report. And then our policy is the one that where we've committed to do it within 30 days. And that's, um, so it doesn't look like there's any requirement or anything saying we couldn't change that to like 60 days, for example. Um, it's kind of, you know, when Pam um, brought the auditor's uh, recommendation to me, this was one, I, I don't usually disagree with them, but this is not one that I really agreed with or felt passionately about because to me, you know, if we cancel a council meeting to take a summer recess, um, I don't see like that, that's pretty clear we're not violating our policy by failing to do you know our report it's just that meeting got canceled so to me i thought this was a little nitpicky um uh from them so i'm not like super passionate to or you know super urgent or um excited about like rushing to change our policy to get into compliance without looking at that closer so uh council member haney i see your hand up you know james also because we don't meet that often uh -huh. Um, you know, I, I mean, by the time you do your, your deeper dive and we come back, um, well, yeah. we're going to come back probably in May, yeah, something like that before we, you know, um, uh, so that we review the budget heading, uh, the council, mm -hmm. um, I'd have no problem passing 30 to 60 days. I, I, I don't see it be, being that big of an issue. Right. And I, I discussed this with Pam and I understand the reason and I think that uh, we should make it the 60 days just to make it easy for staff to do what the what they wanted us to do mm -hmm. and yeah, let's make it easy for staff that's a good idea right <laughs> well what, what we could do if everybody's on board I think everybody understands like the idea and it's it's basically just so that when we take a account when there's a council council meeting can canceled uh that we're not violating our policies because we are canceling a council meeting and so um i think uh what we could do if there's consensus to move that forward we'll 
we'll research that and then we'll, you know, if there's a problem, if we do find a problem, then we'll pause. But if, if it's clear, we'll send a follow-up email to everybody, letting everybody know, and that we'll move it forward. So, you know, you know, James, you guys um, received an exceptional um, report back from the audit. Yeah, thank you. Um, if this is one of the little things they pointed out, I don't think that's that big a deal. I think it's like, yeah, you know, maybe they're, you know, again, maybe they were just doing their job, but yeah. Um, but you guys, Pam and you did an incredible job and, and it showed in, uh, in the audit and, and uh, the comments that they brought back to us. So thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, it's one of those things when we got some of these recommendations back, I was like, well, these are pretty, you know, ticky tacky um, uh, things. But I think on the other hand, that's that's a positive because it means that they're really looking at things closely right. uh, and not just uh, rubber stamping the audit. So. Yeah, they have to find something, right? Wait, yeah, but you know, yeah. <laughs> we had had the same auditors for I think it was I think we ended up figuring out it was close to nine years. I think <coughs> by the end, before with those auditors, we weren't getting really any comments back. You know, so right. um, so anyway, so it's positive overall. Okay, so I think I heard a consensus then. So we'll move forward unless we, um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll confirm with the auditors that, that the 60 days is appropriate. Uh, if there is any issue, we'll report back and we will pause it at that time, so. Okay, so the, that's item number two. Item number three is um, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. And this is the, the only one we have a couple slides to give a little bit of detail. Um, we noted at council uh, last week that we had received the first installment of what is supposed to be two checks uh, for the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, we are supposed to receive two payments of $893,000. Um, you know, we walked through our budget and talked about how our budget's been impacted probably close to $5 million so far. Uh, we can show pretty easily. Um, so we'll end up getting about 1.8 million back. It's not everything, but at least we're, you know, able to get some of that, um, some of that lost uh, revenue back. And so uh, we wanted to go through this a little bit uh, and talk a little bit before we get the second uh, payment, which we're expecting to receive in July. Um, to date, we've received that $893,000 payment, but we've also, and, and the only other funding we've, we've received related to COVID is a $150,000 pass through from the state through the county. Um, the state had provided funding to the county early on and said, basically, you know, pass on some of the funding to the city. So we had gotten $150,000 from that. Um, we got $93,000 from the state uh, for, for CARES Act funding. And then the big chunk, and I think uh, Council Member Haney mentioned this at the council meeting, is the biggest chunk we had gotten up until just recently was the $400 plus thousand dollars that we received for, um, for the trolley, uh, because the Department of Transportation has actually provided a lot of funding to the different agencies. And so that's everything we've received. We've lost, um, you know, a lot more than we've received. But the next payment we're expected to get is a second eight hundred ninety-three thousand dollar payment in July. And so we have a couple just budget slides. We had given some of this information at council, but we've updated it actually. And the update actually shows a little bit more positivity. Uh, we had showed that at fifty percent of the year, we were at about fifty percent of the revenue. Uh, Pam was able to update that with an additional month of data now that um, now that we're in February. And so we're actually at 58.3% of the year and we're at 58.2% of revenue. So we're right on track with where we thought we would be uh, when we adopted the budget. Uh, the big uh, change over the last month, we had said the timing of receiving some of this revenue from other agencies was showing that this number was showing this number lower than it really should be. So now, uh, since we got a bunch of payments in December, um, that that's the biggest change that shows how we bumped up to about 58.2% of our uh, revenues. So our revenues are on track. We, we dug into this more at, at the council meeting. 
that we, without COVID, we probably would expect to have a 12 to 13, maybe even $14 million revenue. Uh, was, is, that's where we were at, where we were on track to get to that. Um, because of COVID, we're, we've been budgeting more conservatively at about 10.8 million. And that looks to be about where we're, like we're right on track for 10, 10.8 million this year. So, so it's, we're still being impacted. I think it's fair to say, you know, recovering, but not, um, not to the level we would be otherwise. And then um, for expenditures, um, we did a similar exercise by showing the adopted expenditures and then showing where we were at. And this is what we had showed at council um, through December. So 50% of the year, we were able to reduce expenditures um, from what had been adopted. Now we're at 58% of the year and we're at about 52% of expenditures. So we're still um, uh, trending well. We're, we're still trending well on both revenue and expenditures. Um, I think the biggest change on this, on the expenditures is we did pay a bunch of uh, uh, contractors. Uh, we, you know, it's kind of the time of year, end of, end of the year, they usually send all their invoices. So we paid a bunch of those. So there's a kind of a big jump in the contractor payments. Um, and then in particular, the Stewart Canyon project, uh, we had, we just had all of the um, vendors submit their invoices on that project, which is a big multi-million dollar project. So, um, so with the, all that being said, the um, what we have to do when we receive that eight hundred ninety-three thousand dollar payment is we have to identify which of the four categories that the state allows you, or the, I'm sorry, the feds allow you to use that money for, we have to identify which of the four we will be using it for. So um, option one is replacing lost revenue. Like, and like we said, we are in a situation, some cities are getting more money than they lost. So they can't claim all of it as lost revenue. They have to use some of the other, the excess funding um, for one of these other three categories. We, uh, I guess in some ways, <laughs> it's, it doesn't sound positive, but it, it, it allows us flexibility uh, because we've lost more than we are getting where we would be able to say all of it is lost revenue and be able to put it all towards um, replacing lost general fund revenue. Uh, there are three other categories. And if you've watched the news or anything, you've probably seen other cities um, that, like I said, didn't lose as much revenue. They, they did some of these other things. Um, item two is, are the second category is public health and economic impacts. And so that was, uh, like doing things like, um, which we also did, uh, but it's things like, you know, purchasing the like sinks and hand sanitizers and face coverings and, and COVID tests and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we could have also, uh, designated that category and just use it to pay pay for those expenses. Um, the third uh, category is uh, the premium pay for frontline uh, workers. Uh, so if you've seen a city, um, like I think Port Wainimi did it recently, where they took the money that exceeded what they lost, and then they gave it to all of the um, grocery store employees in the city. Uh, that's that's an example of uh, when a city is, uh, designates that funding for that purpose. Um, and then number four is water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, uh, which I haven't seen a city, I think Ventura was the only city that I had heard was going to designate some of the funds towards that. But then they had a weird thing happen where then it turned out they were getting less than they thought they were. And so when they when that happened, they dropped a couple of the projects out. So um, so anyway, so when we get the money, we have to designate what category it is and show what we're using it for in that category. So we recommend it for the first round, and we also recommend for the second round. Again, for all the reasons we just explained, we're recommending we con we consider it replacing lost revenue, which would then allow us to. Um, 
build back the reserve that had dropped from 3.4 million to 700,000 and try and put that funding towards rebuilding that since we had to use that when, when we lost all that revenue. And so we are, the items on the agenda, uh, because we're asking the budget committee to, um, to agree with that recommendation or, uh, you know, alternatively could uh, vote to, um, to you to identify it as one of these other categories, but we recommend replacing lost revenue. Uh, Councilmember Haney, I see your hand. So, um, James, are you allowed to use more than one of these uh, line items for mm -hmm. use of the money? Yeah. So, um, and when we say low income, uh, lower income, and frontline workers, do frontline workers include our staff? Uh, yes, uh, Oxnard, uh, Oxnard actually did a, um, a, uh, like a, you know, a premium pay for their staff as part of this. Yes. So how many employees do we have? 25? Uh, about, yeah, 25, uh, full-time employees. So if we bonus every city employee a thousand dollars, um, we'd be taking $25,000 from the 893, which would still be a significant amount of money to be placed back into the reserve. Um, that's something that, I, that, that I'd like to see us. I'd like to see us do something that says thank you to the workers in our community who um, for the last two years, in fact, um, part of me says that, you know, we had, we had this discussion at Gold Coast and we were gonna offer I think it was $500. And I thought that that was an insult to any bus driver that was operating in the conditions that Gold Coast drivers were. Um, and maybe a thousand isn't enough, but I'd be willing to look at something to bonus um, the, the staff members of the, of the city. Um, I don't know what um, anyone else thinks about that, but I'm open for a discussion on it. Mayor Six, I see. Sorry, I, I was looking. I, I missed your hand. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I love that idea, Randy, and I would love to give away tons of money. So many people deserve it. I also really feel strongly that we need to get back to that fifty percent reserve rate and really set that as a goal, because clearly we don't know what's going to happen. Look what's happened in the last two years, and um, just get it. We're about forty percent right now, James uh probably probably around there yeah um well what do you think steve i think you know i kind of support or i do support staff recommendation of replacing the lost revenue because um you know we've discussed this before and i think we all you know decided that that's where we would put this money it seems like at our last meeting yeah. Yeah, I think the the one other thought I would um, the other piece that ties into this conversation a little bit is that uh, Pim and I uh, in March um, were planning to review our budgets and uh, and um, uh, potentially um, recommend to the city council that we do consider uh, like the, um, you know, the cost of living increase this year, um, which I know is a bigger discussion. So that's why I'm kind of debating how, how deep to get into that conversation. But I think, you know, the simple, the simple uh, point I'll make is that I think everybody's reading right now about inflation being like, you know, um, off the charts and, you know, five, five plus percent. Uh, and so, um, we were talking about, you know, uh, typically when we do a cost of living increase, we do those in March. And so I think, although I haven't, I didn't double check this before the meeting, I think that we actually did include in the budget um, a, enough where we would have a couple percent cost of living increase without, uh, without um, having to identify any additional funding. And so I think the reason why I'm saying all this is that uh, I, I think, uh, like Councilmember Haney said, I've heard of a couple cities trying to do like the $500 payments, 
and the um, the reaction from the employees it, it has tended to not be it's like that's not enough you know and then I heard of I think Pro Enemy did a thousand dollar payment and it wasn't enough and uh, be, and so I think just like um, classifying the funding as like a, as like the hazard pay quote unquote it's like it doesn't get a positive reaction but I think instead um, just looking closely at the fair, you know, cost of living increase this year would be like a, the way to maybe do that a little bit, um, a little bit different. So anyway, I, I saw hands go up. Um, I, I didn't see who was first, so I'm just going to go in order on my screen. Councilmember Haney. Uh, um, uh, 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 I'm drawing a blank. The mayor had her hand okay. up and hadn't taken mine, taking mine okay. down. Okay. I'll speak, I'll speak after her. Okay, Mayor Sticks. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I would. I think that's a great idea, James. Cost of living increase, and I would really support that. So. Okay. Cool. That'd be a great thing. Thank you, and thanks Thank again, you. James and Pam. I don't know how you did it. I think you're going to look back <laughs> and, you're and say, "How did we do that?" <laughs> <laughs> we already have that every once in a while. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I think. Um, I believe we ended up putting the couple percent in because we just we were looking around and realizing that, you know, with inflation that we, it was going to be a problem this year. So um, so I think that that is an option we have. Uh, Council Member Haney. So uh, so ultimately what happened at Gold Coast was we were also in contract negotiations. Uh, so we ultimately ended up giving um, the bus drivers uh, uh, three uh, three percent cost of living for three years in a row. So they got a 9% raise. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, they got retro back six months. And then on top of that, we increased entry level positions. Entry level positions are still getting bonused when they're hired. Wow. And we moved up um, all the other pay to meet regional standards, which is about 22, 22 to $23 an hour. Um, so I'm saying that we did it, uh, you know, we did it there other ways and uh, that's what I'm hearing here, but ultimately this money is a gift. And, um, and to me, um, it's not coming, it's not coming out of anything other than federal monies that have been set aside. Um, it's almost like a grant if you want to look at it that way, but yeah, so right. I'm just saying that, that that's my suggestion. I'd like to see it in the minutes because I'm gonna make the same recommendation to council when this comes back and let council weigh in on it. Okay. I just think it's, um, even though it's a thousand dollars a year, I just think it's something that we need to say thank you to the employees of this community who uh, bent over backwards, you know, to, to service us um, in this time. So I just think uh, it warrants something. Yeah, well, I'm sure, you know, I didn't, uh... I had talked about how I had heard other agencies where the employees were like, this was not, you know, this, this was not fair for, you know, the hazards we were, went through it ever. So I didn't uh, mean to imply that that would be the reaction here. I just was noting that I've seen that in, in other agencies. I think, I think people would appreciate it here. I think the, the other question that kind of pops up for me right away when we start talking about that is it's like, if you if you work at a grocery store in town and you hear about this, you know I think people would say, "Where's where's mine?" You know, I had I was on the front line just as much, or more. You know, probably more so in some cases. You know, a grocery store employee deals with more people every day than than you know I do, um, just because of the pure numbers going through. So I think um, I've seen cities try to do that too, where they tried to do. Um, like they they got a list of every grocery store employee who worked over you know a thousand hours during the pandemic and they gave them like a thousand dollar bonus and it it always goes wrong where there's somebody that's not that shouldn't get it that should that or that does or vice versa or you know or problems like that so but uh but anyway uh so yes we could um uh, I, I think it's a good sentiment. I just, in practice, I don't know how we do it. So, so James, this is my take on private enterprise versus public entity. Yeah. Um, I think they're two different issues. I think if every a store owner wanted to give one of their employees or their employees raises or bonuses, that's personal. I know what I've done. 
Yeah. Okay. And I know what I've done coming out of COVID. Yeah. Um, for my employees. Now I don't have 25. I only have five. Um, but I'm just saying the you know, private, the private sector is on their own. All I'm saying is, um, you know, this is, these are federal funds um, that I think that we can look at differently. So yeah. that's just, again, it's just my take. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the sentiment. And I think um, Pam and I probably something we have to figure out is, is to how to let everybody know we do appreciate it. Uh, I think the point's well taken, you know, that um, uh, I kept, it's funny for the first couple of months of COVID, I kept telling everybody, you know, when you work here, you sign up to be an emergency response, you know, our emergency services, you know, worker, disaster services worker. But I, at some point, I remember being three or four months in and being like, I don't think any of us signed up for this <laughs> to be, to be this long. So yeah, for two years, you have to show that appreciation. So, yeah. All right. So, okay. So I think, um, then we'll move forward with that and we will note like um like you suggested uh council member Haney will note um uh the kind of the vote i think i well i guess um so james i just had one more question on this sure. so i wrote down the numbers so we're getting the 893 twice mm -hmm. about and one on top of that we're getting 445 150 and 93. Mm -hmm. so we're getting um we're almost getting what two point six 2.7 million yes although some of that like the the, the 450,000 from transportation that can't be used for anything other than trolley but right right we, I, I understand that yeah. but i'm just saying we're we received additional funding yep. and we should state that also the total yep. that we're um that we've received because i think yeah. that's important too yeah we'll do that we have um uh we'll include this in the report and then we'll include um we'll total that out and show what we've received. And hopefully, you know, right now we're on a positive trend with our reserves. So hopefully we keep that up. And, and like one thing, you know, if you really look at our reserve policy, it's what it actually says is that um, we won't add any new expenses until we get to the 50%, you know, uh, reserve. And so, um, you know, it's actually a good incentive to get to the 50% because once we get to 50%, we can start looking at, you know, at, at doing some, some things that the city's wanted to do for a long time. So. Well, I figured once we get a couple more um, cannabis lounges going and <laughs> a couple more things at the east end of town there, you know, in, in the, uh, what I call it, the, uh, the the shady area of our community. <laughs> the that, great uh, um, we, we, remember, all cannabis revenue is going to the reserves right now. Yeah, 360,000 a year, you know, that's going in. So we'll, we'll get there at this rate. You know, that's, that's the positive. I think Pam and I had that realization about maybe two or three months ago is it's always been like, will the city get to the reserve? Right now we're on pace where we, you know, we should, we, we'll get there. It's a question of when, you know, as long as we keep at the rate we're going, so. Well, and when the inn is happy, we're happy, right? <laughs> yeah, they're back to, I know they're back to 100% capacity, they've, they've said, but they are, uh, just like everybody, um, they say that just because they're open to 100%, when Omicron was here, they were not anywhere near 100%. So, you know, they're susceptible to those surges as well, so. It's made, uh, I think everybody, as all of us realize how dependent we are, mm -hmm. or, well, symbiotic. Yeah. So. So, so I'll I'll stop talking because I've got about nine more minutes. I have an appointment at four o'clock. Okay. Last item we'll get through very quickly. Uh, we'll keep simple. James. Yeah. James. Yeah. Before before you go on, sure. so you're going to um, take to council that the oh. majority voted to or didn't vote. Yes. They Sorry I, to yeah, was... use it for revenue. Yes, sorry, I was I was summarizing that and then I went off on a tangent. So yes, I'll we'll note that um, that the consensus was to do that, but we'll note that uh, we'll note council council member Haney's um, uh, you know uh, that his recommendation was to consider that um, uh, hat the some premium type, pay category some type of a bonus. Yep, yep, right. yeah. But I agree, Steve. It should state that, that the majority wanted that. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm behind that. Thank you. 
So the last item is actually very simple. It's kind of just more of a heads up um, that, so we don't normally, uh, they call it qualifying for a single audit. Um, and that, what that means is when you get a certain amount of grant funding, you then have to perform an additional audit called a single audit. So it's actually, you know, it's kind of another, <coughs> it's another layer of reporting and another layer of, of work basically. But um, we never, we haven't done it. And I think it's been like 10 years here in Ohio because we just haven't received uh, more than $750,000 in grants, in uh, federal grants in any given year. Uh, but because of the all those funds we just listed on the last slide, we are going to exceed that 750,000 this year. And so this means we'll have to perform a single audit. Uh, we wanted to basically let everybody on the committee know and then also um really i think the biggest thing is the positive is our contract with our auditors we actually uh included a requirement that if we get a single audit they have to perform the single audit so our auditors will be um doing the bulk of it but it also it is staff time uh you know and particularly finance department time uh, it's another audit that they'll have to work with the auditors on to complete. So um, uh, we weren't necessarily expecting to have to do a single audit because we haven't done one in so long, but we have hit that requirement. And so we're letting everybody know. I don't think, uh, Pam, did the, in our agenda, was there any action required from that? Or was I think it was just letting everybody know, right? Receive an update on the financial audit. No action. Just yeah. Update. So there's no action with it. It's just kind of a heads up. And then that probably means that the auditors are going to be around again when they normally wouldn't be for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, the auditors will be here and they may be, you know, they, they tend to reach out to the, um, the budget committee and the treasurer. So I think all of us may hear something about it in the next couple of months. But it's, it's technically a positive thing because it means we got a lot of grant funding. Uh, but it is, it's just us having to report on it. So it's not you know, it's not the most exciting thing. So, so James, just um, a quick, uh, a quick question on ATP sure. grants. Do how are we, how are we going to? We haven't, we we haven't received more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on those. And then in, how about Stewart Canyon? Yeah, not in a single year. And um, and so, like ATP, for example, I think all in, I think we've received about six hundred fifty thousand of the three point five million so far. And that's been over, you know, the five years that that project's been in effect. But the year that we do construction, it will definitely trigger this. You know, we expect that we expect in uh, probably, I think it's January of 2023 to, um, uh, it should be completed in 2023. That there would probably be about three million dollars. You know, can, most can of it. We, can we hire um, um, an additional? Um, staff person and use ATP funding to pay for that position to meet all of the uh, grant um, reporting requirements or so, does that have to come out of, of our coffers? Yeah, so um, that's actually, that's a good question. I actually had just uh, called um, some of the grant people and was trying to figure this out because we are realizing that the challenge with the ATP is that is like, that is almost like a project that is big enough that like it could keep our public works department busy for the year, you know, on its own. When you look at like the design work, the potential uh, construction work, the right of way negotiation, you know, all of that stuff. And I see I'm running out of time, but so, um, I just did meet with uh, Alma and we talked about how they don't have the staff right now to really do all the grant paperwork and the reimbursements and the you know invoicing and all that. So I we actually just talked at our idea. We don't know if we could hire somebody full time uh, with the grant because there's you know it's like what do you do with them afterwards and how are the benefits paid? But what we are going to try to do is is get a contractor using the grant funds. Um, so we, you know, we think it'll be about a $30,000 contract to get somebody to just manage the whole, um, all the reimbursement and billing and all that. Well, an ATP is going to be closer to 5 million. 
Yeah. It, well, I think it's 4.5 million all in right. right now. Yeah. And like you said, the, the, the reporting requirements for Stewart Canyon. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these are, are huge. It's not just ATP. Yeah. I would think that's one of the big, you know, anyone that goes after grants, that's probably the, one of the biggest obstacles of getting grants is accounting for them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not just, oh, I got $500,000. Now I can go spend it. You've got to, you've got to, you know, you, you've got to report, yeah. you know, the who, what, why, when, where, and how. Yeah. It's real simple. Yeah. We're, we're bringing an item to council on March 8th um, that we're, we're trying to get some bids right now because we're trying to bring an item to actually have a, a contract grant manager um, that would be responsible for everything from finding the grant, applying for the grant, billing for the grant, you know, reporting on the grant and closing it out. And so we're, we're actually working on that because of kind of what you said, all the grants that are coming down the pike. And then now there's the infrastructure act and all of these other things. We think that now's the time to strike on that. So, so we're going to try to bring an item to council on March 8th to try to get someone contract who can just handle all that. So. That's a great idea. Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Thank you. And so on that last item, there's no action. So um, uh, if there's any other questions, we'll take them. But otherwise, I think uh, I think we're about through it, right? At, right on the dot, four o'clock. Well done. <laughs> All right. Good. J James? Sure. I don't want to take up time, but in the investment policy, there is a on the oversight committee and our um, budget yeah. and finance committee, it does say that the applicants shall apply for this position and be selected in the same manner as the city's various commissions. The committee meets at least annually, you know, so I know we had, I, you know, I remember seeing that at one time it's number 18. Okay. In the, uh, you know, just, and that's what we're going to do anyway, you know. Yeah, so. I'm going to say it matches what we're going to do, but that that's uh, helpful. Thank you. Pam and I were looking through the code because uh, we thought it was in the code, and we found the Disaster Council and, and a bunch of other commissions, but we could not find that one. So I, I think you spotted it. And, uh, you said it's in the investment policy? Right. I'm, I'm, it's point eighteen. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Nice right. Sorry to take time. Thanks for finding that. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye.